1944, on a tiny island in the vast Pacific Ocean, 33 people found themselves stranded. Among them were 32 men and just one woman, Kazuko Higa. This happened right after the Second World War, a time when the world was in chaos. Sadly, these people were left all alone, far away from any big land, and they had to figure out how to survive. For several years they lived on this island without much help or attention. Imagine that. No one came to rescue them during this time. Finally, in 1951, after many years of struggle, they were saved. But here's the sad part. Out of the 32 men who were there at the beginning, only 20 survived. The rest, 12 of them, were either killed or had disappeared. What caused this tragedy? It's believed that fights broke out among the men, all because of the presence of the only woman in the group. This heartbreaking tale is the story of the Queen of Anahattan. In the vast Pacific Ocean, there's a tiny island called Anatahan. This island is special because it's home to one of the most active volcanoes in the whole group of islands here. The volcano last erupted from 2007 to 2008, making quite a spectacle. But what really makes Anatahan famous is the peculiar story of the Queen of Anatahan and her 32 companions. Anatahan, nestled in the northern Mariana Islands in the vast Pacific Ocean, is known for harboring one of the most active volcanoes in the region. Presently, this island remains uninhabited due to the constant threat of volcanic eruptions. Anatahan sits about 60 kilometers, 32 nautical miles, northwest of Farallon de Medinila and 120 kilometers, 65 nautical miles, north of Saipan. The island's discovery by Europeans dates back to late October 1543, when the Spanish explorer Bernardo de la Torre, aboard the Carac San Juan de Letran, charted its shores. At that time, Anatahan was home to the Chamorro people. However, in 1695, the Chamorros were forcibly relocated first to Saipan and, three years later, to Guam. Under Spanish rule, Anatahan's coconut plantations flourished, primarily for the production of copra. In 1884, they exported around 125 tons of copra. After Spain sold the Northern Marianas to the German Empire in 1899, Anatahan became part of German New Guinea. Yet, by May 1901, the island was reported as being without inhabitants. In 1902, a private firm called the Pagan Society, owned by a German and a Japanese partner, leased the island to further develop its coconut plantations. However, severe typhoons in September 1905 and September 1907 wreaked havoc on the plantations, leading to the company's bankruptcy. Despite this setback, copra production persisted, but on a smaller scale. During World War I, Anatahan fell under the control of the Empire of Japan and was subsequently administered as part of the South Seas Mandate. Now, Anatahan isn't a giant island by any means. It's a small piece of land, only covering about eight square kilometers. But even though it's little, it's a place of remarkable natural beauty. Picture lush green landscapes, unique animals, and views that'll take your breath away. Surprisingly, Anatahan isn't a hotspot for tourists. It's tucked away in a remote corner, far from the usual touristy hustle and bustle. Instead, Anatahan has a peaceful and unspoiled vibe. Its history is fascinating, especially during World War II. You see, this island became an unexpected sanctuary for a group of people who were stranded there. And the story of their time on Anatahan is both astonishing and deeply touching. In the midst of the chaos of World War II in 1944, three Japanese ships met a tragic fate, sinking near Anatahan. Luckily, 31 surviving Japanese men managed to swim to safety on the island. There they found Kikui Chirohiga and his wife Kazuko, who were taking care of the plantation. So, on this small island, 32 men and one woman, Kazuko, made their home. They survived by eating local fruits, vegetables and animals while they waited for the war to end. Life was relatively peaceful until 1946, when Kikui Chirohiga passed away. That's when things took a turn. Amidst the turmoil of the war, 
these people were desperately seeking safety. Anatahan became their refuge, and among them was the only woman, Kazuko Higa. Despite the challenges of living on this beautiful but tough island, Kazuko's strong character and leadership skills stood out. The group came to respect her as a fellow survivor and someone they could look up to. Life on the island was far from easy. Every day brought new challenges, from finding enough food to building shelters and staying safe from the island's natural forces. But with Kazuko leading them, the group faced these challenges together, working as a team to make the best of their unexpected situation. Between the First and Second World Wars, the Mariana Islands were under Japanese control. During this time, a company called Ngo Kohatsu, which roughly translates to South Sea Development Company, was working on agricultural projects in the region. Specifically, they had a plantation on Anatahan. This plantation was managed by a man named Kikui Chiro, and his assistant and wife Kazuko were there to support him. They were also joined by several local residents who worked for the company. As the war unfolded and Japan faced setbacks against the Allies, the conflict eventually reached Anatahan. In 1944, a group of 31 sailors found themselves stranded on the island after their ship had been badly damaged in combat. These sailors were all young men, mostly in their late teens to early 20s. At the time, Kazuko's husband was away on another island, unable to return to Anatahan due to heavy military activity in the area. Fearing what these young men might do to her on this isolated and lawless island, Kikuichiro decided to pretend to be Kazuko's husband. He hoped that the sailors would refrain from causing trouble with a married couple. So, Kazuko, Kikuichiro, and the 32 sailors, along with a small group of local islanders, began their survival journey on this tiny speck of land in the Pacific Ocean. Fortunately, the island had fertile soil, allowing them to grow potatoes, catch fish, and occasionally consume rats and lizards that lived there. They even managed to make a kind of alcohol from the palm trees. For the time being, they had enough resources to sustain themselves. In the summer of 1945, Japan surrendered to the Allies, and occasionally, American ships would visit the island. They used loudspeakers to announce that the war was over, urging anyone left on the island to surrender. The local islanders quickly boarded the American ships and left, seeking safety elsewhere. However, Kikuichiro, Kazuko and the Japanese sailors were hesitant to do the same. There were a couple of reasons for this. First, they feared that if they surrendered to the Americans, they might face harm or even death. Second, they found it hard to believe that Japan had lost the war. They had enough resources on the island to sustain their lives, so they chose to continue their survival there. At first, Kazuko and Kikuichiro lived separately from the sailors, only interacting when necessary. But things took a turn in the summer of 1946, when one of the sailors stumbled upon the remains of a B-29 bomber, which had presumably crashed on the island during the war. On the pilot's corpse, they found a pistol, and this discovery disrupted the delicate balance of power on the island. The sailor who found the pistol used it to threaten Kikuichiro, demanding to have Kazuko for himself. Kikuichiro had no choice but to give in, and the sailor became Kazuko's second husband. However, this second husband met a tragic end. Depending on who you asked, the reasons for his death differed. Kazuko later claimed he fell off a cliff, while some of the sailors believed Kikuichiro was responsible and had killed him. Not long after the second husband's death, Kikuichiro himself was found dead under mysterious circumstances. In the beginning, Kazuko claimed that Kikuichiro died from food poisoning after eating a raw crab. However, she later changed her story, suggesting that her third husband, the man who would later become her third spouse, was responsible for Kikuichiro's death. But it didn't stop there. This third husband met a tragic end as well. He was murdered by another man, who would then become Kazuko's fourth husband. Around this time, rumors started swirling that Kazuko was involved with men other than her pseudo-husbands. This led to tension and fighting among the group of sailors. 
They began to blame Kazuko as the cause of the deaths and overall discord among them. Fearing that one of the men might turn against her, Kazuko decided it would be safer to surrender herself to the Americans. She hid in the jungle for about a month, waiting for a passing ship to rescue her. Finally, in 1950, she succeeded in escaping the island on an American ship and was taken back to Japan. One year later, in the summer of 1951, the remaining sailors on the island were also rescued and brought back to Japan. However, there was a puzzling discrepancy. Out of the 32 men who were initially on the island, only 20 were still alive. What happened to the other nine? The truth is, we don't have a clear answer. Kazuko changed her story multiple times, and her claims didn't match what the sailors had to say, as I'll explain in more detail later. Back in Japan, Kazuko learned that her real husband was still alive, but had married another woman, assuming Kazuko had perished during the chaotic times of the war and its aftermath. Unable to return to her husband, Kazuko needed a way to make a living on her own. She tried to do this through the media, and various media companies were eager to interview her. Kazuko's story of a lone woman surviving on an island with a group of men quickly spread through newspapers and magazines, turning her into something of a celebrity. Kazuko often spoke about her relationships with many men on the island and how they would fight and even kill each other because of her. Whether these claims were true or if she exaggerated the story for attention remains a topic of debate. However, in the eyes of the public, Kazuko was generally seen as a strong woman who survived on an island surrounded by men. They began referring to her as the Queen of Anatahan. A theatre play was even created based on the story of the Queen of Anatahan, and Kazuko took on the remarkable role of playing herself in it. She spent two years touring Japan, gracing various theatres with her presence. Kazuko didn't stop there, she starred in a full-length movie about her life, once again portraying herself as the main character. Hollywood also made a movie about her story, although she didn't participate in that one. Joseph von Sternberg's final film, The Saga of Anatahan, was made in Japan. Sternberg believed it to be his best work, but also considered it his least successful. The movie remained relatively unknown, even into the early 1960s. This anonymity came after it performed poorly both commercially and critically in Japan and the United States. During its initial release in 1953, when Japanese audiences saw the film with Japanese dialogue and English narration by Sternberg himself, many critics reacted with indifference or shock. They were particularly taken aback by the distant and dry English narration. Sternberg's authoritative voice commented on various scenes depicting the intense and sometimes violent desires of the men toward a young and beautiful woman, as well as the challenging communal life of the nearly naked Japanese drifters on a tropical island. The film explored their desires for power, survival, various religious and patriotic rituals, constant fear of both in-group violence and the Allied enemy, and a strong yearning for their homeland. Before and during Sternberg's time in Japan, there was significant media coverage of the real Anatahan incident. When the media reported the return of the survivors, treating them as unfortunate war heroes, the public showed sympathy. However, towards the end of 1951, the media began sharing highly dramatized accounts of the mysterious deaths of five men and their romantic involvement with Higa Kazuko. Executives at Daiwa, the film's production company, were aware of the unfavorable public reactions to the Anatahan incident. This made them question why Sternberg chose this particular story for the film. When Sternberg arrived in August 1952, he told journalists that he wasn't interested in the real Anatahan incident. He proudly declared that his version of the Anatahan story was somewhat independent from the real events and assured that the film would meet the expectations of the Japanese audience whom he had admired since his first visit to Japan in 1936. During this time, Higa found herself constantly in the public eye. She lived in her hometown in Okinawa under the US occupation, but frequently traveled to the mainland for magazine interviews and entertainment shows. 
Her aim was to defend herself against false accusations made by the media. Heger toured the country with a theatre group and even acted in a stage play called The Queen Bee of Anatahan. Additionally, she portrayed her own life on Anatahan in a low-budget documentary drama film titled This is the Truth of Anatahan, which was released in April 1953, two months before Sternberg's Anatahan. However, the public, especially intellectuals, remained indifferent or critical towards her. By the time Sternberg's film hit theatres, people were tired of hearing about the Anatahan incident, regardless of claims to its authenticity. Some Japanese intellectuals continued to protest against the real incident and Higa Kazuko. Strangely, certain Japanese critics expressed their disgust about the incident as if it represented the national opinion. One notable critic, Kitagawa Fuyuhiko, criticized Sternberg's sympathy towards Kazuko and the men on the island. He questioned the portrayal of the survivors' return to Japan, wondering if Sternberg cynically depicted these men, who had committed ridiculous acts, as heroes. Kitagawa believed that the returning men deserved punishment for their actions, and the film should have shown their grief and regret to make a moral statement about their absurd behaviors on the island. He also disliked the way Kazuko was depicted as normal in the final scenes, insisting that Sternberg should not depict Japan if he couldn't understand Japanese post-war sentiments. In essence, Kitagawa's critique reflected the sentiments of many Japanese intellectuals and suggested that Sternberg failed to grasp the emotions of post-war Japan. Regrettably for Kazuko, the reviews for her stage shows and movie weren't very positive, mainly because of her less than stellar acting skills. Around this time, some of the sailors decided to tell their side of the story about the Queen of Anatahan by publishing their own books. One of these sailors claimed that Kazuko used seduction to get food, clothing, and other resources from the men. He also said she manipulated the men into fighting each other, leading to the deaths of at least nine men due to these conflicts. As time passed, Kazuko's reputation took a hit. Her poor performances on stage, along with the sailors' accusations, painted her as a manipulative woman who controlled men for her own gain. She started backpedaling on her earlier claims, saying she had no choice but to get close to some men to survive. According to her revised story, only two men had died due to fights over her. The others had passed away from hunger, food poisoning, or accidents like falling off cliffs. Despite her attempts to explain herself, the damage was done. People began harassing her in public, and job offers and media appearances dried up. To escape the attention, Kazuko moved to the countryside. Over time, the media frenzy around the Queen of Anatahan faded away. Details about what happened to Kazuko afterward are scarcer, but she eventually got married and ran a small restaurant. Tragically, she passed away in 1971 at the age of 51 due to a brain tumor. The question remains, was Kazuko truly a wicked woman who manipulated and indirectly caused the deaths of several men for her own desires, or was she merely a victim of circumstance? Stranded on a remote island surrounded by men, she might have done what she had to do to protect herself. Examining the history of Anatahan, spanning from the pre-war years to its release during the US occupation in Japan, sheds light on how specific political and cultural contexts influence the film's interpretation. This historical perspective reveals how various individuals and groups projected their interests onto the film and how they perceived it from different viewpoints. Looking closely at the painstaking efforts put in by Sternberg and his Japanese production team helps us grasp the heavily mediated and collaborative nature of this lesser-known international co-production. Their work added intricate layers to the film's narrative. In Japan, the reception of the film mirrored a collective desire to move past the defeat experienced during the war. Sternberg's intervention, as seen by some critics, was met with resistance, as it clashed with the prevailing sentiment of forgetting the past. For some, recalling wartime memories was an uncomfortable experience, and Sternberg's approach stirred resistance, as it seemed to interfere with this process of collective forgetting. On the other hand, 
There were those who saw the film as a mere visualization of trivial and personal memories, relevant only to a small group of Japanese individuals who had undergone similar experiences. In essence, the film became a canvas upon which the complexities of post-war Japan were painted, a blend of reluctant memory, personal recollections, and nationalistic sentiments intertwined within the backdrop of societal change. Through these varied perspectives, the film Anatahan emerged as a reflection of a nation grappling with its past, struggling to reconcile the collective need to forget with the individual urge to remember. Thanks for watching the video, and if you found it informative, please like and subscribe to Time Capsule for similar content. We look forward to sharing more knowledge with you in the future. Until then, take care.